Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the second part of our second lecture. We are still on the theories on personality development. So we're done already with your psychodynamic perspective. Let's proceed now to your traits perspective. Okay, so traits uh, consist of a distinctive set of relatively stable or enduring characteristics or disposition. So personality trait is used to predict how people are likely to behave in different situations. For example, a person may be described as uh, someone having personality traits such as perhaps uh, cheerfulness, maybe outgoingness, okay? So based on these traits, she or he is likely to be involved in many social activities and um, to be a kind or to be kind of a person, All right? So let's take a look at um, people who theorized your traits perspective. So let's take a look at Gordon Alport. So he uh, is the one who authored the hierarchy of traits. So to Gold Gordon Alport, personality traits are inherited but are influenced by experienced. So he claimed that traits could be ranked within a hierarchy in relation, of course, to the degree to which uh, they influence behavior. So according to Gordon Alport, uh, he identified 1,000 uh, of personality traits and he grouped them into three categories. So we have cardinal traits, central traits, and secondary traits. Uh, cardinal traits, according to Alport, are the highest uh, degree level that influence behavior. They are pervasive characteristics that influence a person's behavior in most uh, situations. So, according to Alport, he believed that relatively few people okay, have such dominant traits. A very good example of someone who has this card cardinal trait would be uh, Martin Luther King. He was so committed to justice. Okay, so Martin Luther King was an American Baptist minister and activist who became the most visible spokesperson and uh, leader in the civil rights movement actually in 1954 until his death in 1968. So an example of your cardinal trait is commitment to justice. Okay. Next is your central traits. So according to Alport, the basic building blocks of personality that influence behavior in many situations. So these uh, basically uh, are kinds of traits uh, that you would generally use when you are describing a general characteristic or the general characteristics of other people's behavior. So an example for these uh, central traits would be uh, competitiveness, generosity, okay, uh, what else? Independence, perhaps arrogance, and fearfulness, okay. And then finally is your secondary traits. So secondary traits are more superficial in terms of its level, such as, okay, preference for particular styles of clothing or maybe the type of music, okay, which affect actually your behavior. All right. Another author of your traits perspective is Raymond uh, Cattell. So he authored Mapping the Personality. So Raymond Cattell believed that there are two basic levels of traits. Okay, so we have first here your surface traits. 
Okay, so it lies on the surface of your personality. They are characteristics of personality that can be inferred from observations of behavior. So these are associated with adjectives commonly used to describe personality such as uh, friendliness, uh, stubbornness, uh, emotionality, and perhaps carelessness. Okay, that is surface traits. Right. Next is your source trait. So, a source trait is a set of more general factor or factors of personality. So, Cattell's term of trait at a deep level of personality that are not apparent in observed behavior but must be inferred based on the underlying relationships among surface uh, trait. Okay, so these are the example of your source trait. Sensitive, okay, or sensitivity, imaginative, uh, forthright, okay, straightforward, or maybe shrewd. So these are your source trait. Okay, um, if you want to know your personality according to Raymond Cattell, you may actually go to, um, or you may Google this. All right, and try now to determine your personality. So it might look something like this. Okay, so this is just an example. If you want to know your personality, you can have a personality test on internet. All right, another um, perspective is according to Hans Eysenck. So this is a simpler trait model. So we have here introversion and extroversion, extroversion. So people who are introverts are solitary, reserved, and unsociable, whereas those who are extroverted are outgoing, talkative, cheerful, friendly, and people-oriented. So, in contrast to uh, Cattell's mode, which organized personality trait into a complex hierarchy, Hans uh, constructed a simpler model of personality. Okay, another is neurotism. So, tendencies toward emotional instability, anxiety, and worry. People, according to Hans, who are high on neurotism or emotional instability uh, tend to be tensed, anxious, worrisome, restless, and moody. So those who are low in neurotism tend to be relaxed, calm, stable, and even tempered. So are you high in neurotism or are you low in neurotism? Kaya nga dito nanggaling yung salitang neurotic ka. Okay, something like that. Okay, next is psychotism. So, the tendency is to be perceived as cold and antisocial. So, people who are high on psychotism are perceived as cold, antisocial, hostile, and insensitive. Are you somebody who is high in terms of psychotism or are you somebody who is low or who has low psychotism so those who are low in psychotism are described as warm sensitive concerned oh sorry and concerned about others all right so this is uh hans async um personality types so we have here extroverted introverted emotionally stable okay or low in neurotism and emotionally unstable they have high neurotism so async uh classified people according to the basic personality type uh or types based on combinations of intra uh, introversion and neurotism so we have extroverted neurotic extroverted stable introverted stable and introverted neurotic 
Okay, so he believed that biological differences are actually responsible for the variations in personality traits from person to person. He even argued that introverts inherit nervous system that operates at a higher le level sorry, of arousal than that of extroverts. So if you are somebody who is unstable and extroverted, so you might be someone who is restless, excitable, changeable, active, or maybe impulsive and aggressive. So if you are stable, extroverted, you are outgoing, okay? You are talkative, sociable, lively, carefree, and easygoing. So you are emotionally stable. And if you are stable and you are introverted, you are also controlled, passive, thoughtful, calm, reliable, and careful. However, if you are unstable, introverted, you might be someone who is always anxious, moody, pessimistic, quiet, unsociable, or perhaps reserved. Okay. Next is that we also have the five-factor model of personality, also known as the Big Five. So the five-factor model, or the FFM, okay, according to this model, the dominant contemporary trait model personality consisting of five broad personality factors. So we have neurotism, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. So this is actually useful in predicting many behaviors, including how well students would actually do in college. So this model captures the five broad uh, factors most consistently found in research on personality traits okay, across the number of cultures. So we have here your a five-factor model of personality or the big five. So this model captures um, the five broad factors most consistently found in research on personality traits okay across a number of cultures. So neurotism okay uh, these are emotionally or these people or this personality would pertain to emotional instability which is of course linked to lower grade if you are in school conscientiousness on the other hand there below um is associated with higher grades if you are in school Okay, and with a stronger performance motivation. Why? Because you set your goals and basically you pursue them. Your characteristics would be or your personality would be uh, you are reliable, responsible, self-disciplined, ethical, hardworking, ambitious, okay, uh, and yeah, versus being uh, disorganized, unreliable, lax, impulsive, or careless. According to study, people who are conscientious would have a longer life than people who are not conscientious. Okay, so there you go. Uh, agreeableness, on the other hand, are associated naman with better mental health. Why? Because they have lower level of neurotism and higher level of extraversion and agreeableness. Okay, but uh, remember that these personalities are not fixed. Okay, so maybe if you are not yet conscientious when you are young, uh, conscientiousness actually increases or increase in adulthood. So it's associated with living a healthy, uh, healthy life and, of course, longevity. Okay, so we're done with your traits perspective. Let's proceed now to your uh, social cognitive perspective. So behaviorists uh, believe that personality consists of individuals sum total of an individual's learned behavior 
it is learned based on uh, classical and perhaps operant conditioning. People of different reward and punishment would develop a different pattern of behavior. So, for example, if, um, ano bang name? Maisha is respectful and conscientious in her work habit, of course, it is because she has been rewarded for the kind of behavior in the past. So, if, for example, another person, let's say Tyler, spends more time socializing than studying, it is likely that he has been uh, reinforced more for social interaction rather than academic performance. So, some psychologists uh, proposed uh, models of personality that were quite different from those of Freud and the traits uh, theorist. Social cognitive theorists believe that personality consists of individuals' repertoire of behavior and ways of thinking about themselves and, of course, the world. So, your social cognitive theory is a contemporary model that maintains uh, that to explain behavior need to take into account cognitive and social aspect of behavior so personality comprises not only learned behavior but also the ways of individuals think about themselves and the world around them okay okay so in addition to your social cognitive theory uh, this is also a contemporary learning based model that emphasizes the role of cognitive and environmental factor in determining behavior um, so behaviorists believe that personality is characteristic pattern or patterns of behavior and modes of thinking that definitely determine a person's unique adjustment to the environment. So the three primary contributors to social cognitive theory are Julian Rother, um, Albert Bandura, and Walter Michel. Okay, first, let's take a look at the idea of Julian Rother. Okay, if I mispronounced it, pardon me okay so according to julian he um, authored the locus control explaining and predicting behavior involves knowing an individual's reinforcement history as well as the person's uh, expectancies and subjective values so when we speak of your expectancies Okay, these are your personal predictions of the outcome of your behavior. For example, um, if you as a student hold positive expectancy about school and you believe that okay, st uh, studying will improve your chances of get getting your grades, then of course the outcome of your behavior would be positive. Okay, yun. It depends on your expectations. Subjective values, on the other hand, is the worth you place on a desired outcome. So, for example, a dedicated student will place high uh, subjective value on getting good grades. So, what happens there is that a student now will place a high positive expectancy with high subjective value would be more likely to uh, study for a forthcoming exam where, uh, than someone who does not link studying with grades or who does not care about grades. Okay. So, Rotter uh, believed that uh, people acquire general expectancies about their ability to obtain reinforcement or reinforcements in their lives. Okay. Some, for example, have an internal locus of control or your LOC. Uh, locus in Latin, okay, it means place. 
So an example, for example, an inter or external locus is linked to symptoms of depression and anxiety. Okay, so people with external locus uh, control believe that the outcome in life and the reward or reinforcements uh, they receive are controlled by external forces beyond their control. Yan, such as an example for this would be luck or faith. Yan, external. So people with an internal locus uh, of control are more likely than externals to succeed in school, cope with pain, and in overweight people, make changes in diet and exercise. Okay, next is Albert Bandura. He authored Reciprocal Determinism and Role Expectancies. So, Albert Bandura sees people as an active agent in directing their lives. So, in other words, people are the ones who can control their life. So, they are contributor, uh, contributors sorry, to their life circumstances, not just products of them. So, his model, Reciprocal Determinism, holds that cognitions, behaviors, and environment factors okay, influence each other. Let's take an example or let's take a look at an example. So, in here, suppose a motorist is cut off by another motorist on the road so the first uh, motorist may think angering thoughts such as oh i'm going to teach this guy a lesson so these thoughts or cognitions increase the likelihood of aggressive behavior what is that aggressive behavior for example cutting in front of a mot of the motorist so, the aggressive behavior, okay, in turn affects the social environment or the other motorist's response, okay. So, the other motorist's action then led the first to have even more angering thoughts, okay. What could that angering thought be? I can't let him get away with that, okay, which in turn led to more aggressive behavior so this vicious cycle of escalating behavior and angering thoughts that may result in uh, incidents or in an in incident of road rage which can have a tragic consequence so next um there are two cognitive variables so first is your outcome expectation so these are predictions of the outcome of behavior so bandura emphasizes the role of observational learning or learning by observing and uh, imitating the behavior of others in social contexts so he also emphasized the importance of two cognitive variables okay as we mentioned earlier your outcome expectation the other one is efficacy expectation we'll talk about that in a while so in your outcome expectation um an example for this is that uh, you are more likely to drink alcohol in social situation if you believe that it will be a pleasant experience and perhaps it would increase your confidence than if you think will make you sick or maybe silly yeah okay for the others like let's say for guys who cannot talk okay to the girl they are courting if they are not drunk they are more likely to drink first before they go and court the girl but ladies, if a drunk man will come and court you, ay nako, mag-isip ka na. Okay, next. Efficacy expectation. Okay. Um, 
So these are predictions you hold about your ability to perform tasks or behaviors you set out to accomplish. So people with high efficacy stay the course when confronting difficult challenges. People, on the other hand, with low efficacy tend to give up easily if in the uh, sorry in the face of difficulty i hope guys you have high self-efficacy okay this is very important in life okay so um to sum it up according to bandura um people are actually agents in directing their lives so in his model of reciprocal determinism it holds that uh, cognitions, behaviors, and environment factors uh, influence each other. Bandura believed that individuals can intentionally act as agents of change within their environment, thus altering the factors that determine their behavior. In other words, we have the freedom to influence, okay, um, factors which may determine our behavior. All right. Next, uh, we also have here Walter Michel. So he argued that behavior is influenced by both situation variables, that is, okay environmental factors such as reward or rewards and punishments and person variable or internal personal factors uh, these are your expectancies and subjective values other people variables would include competencies encoding strategies and self-regulatory systems and plans okay so um, Michel or Walter Michel was um, the one who led the study of these children or the children in a marshmallow test. The, the Stanford marshmallow experiment wa was a series of studies on delayed gratification Okay, in the late 1960s and early 1970s led by psychologist Walter Michel, then a professor at Stanford University. So in these studies, uh, a child was offered a choice between one small reward provided immediately or two small rewards if they waited for a short period approximately 15 minutes during which the tester left the room and then returned so the reward was sometimes a marshmallow but often a cookie or a pretzel in a follow-up study, the researcher found that children who were able to wait longer for preferred rewards tended to have better life outcomes, okay, as measured by their maybe SAT scores, educational attainment, body ma mass index, and other life measures. Walter Michel's situation versus person variables would include uh, competencies, a knowledge and skills uh, we possess such as your ability or the ability to play instruments or speak foreign language and uh, encoding strategies um, our personal perceptions of events such as whether we see a sudden gift of flowers as a gesture of love or as a way of make, making amends and then self-regulatory systems and plans would talk about your ability to plan a course of action to achieve uh, the goal and to reward ourselves for accomplishing them right so we're done with your social cognitive perspective. Okay, let's proceed now to humanistic. Uh, uh, 
to humanistic, according to them, actually, we are not puppets whose movements are controlled by our unconscious mind or our environment. But rather, uh, humanistic psychology departed from the psychodynamic and behaviorist in schools in proposing that conscious choice and personal freedom are central features of what it means to be a human being. So humanistic psychologists believe that we are endowed with the ability to make free choice or free choices that give meaning and personal direction to our lives. Okay, let's take a look at some people who authored humanistic perspective. Number one here is Carl Roger. Okay, so Carl Roger believed that each of us uh, possess an inner drive that leads us to strive towards self-actualization, toward uh, realizing our own unique potentials. So according to Carl Rogers' uh, theory of personality, they emphasize or it emphasizes on the importance of the self, the sense of I or me that organizes how you relate to the world. Okay, this is the self fury Rogers. Okay, so the self includes impression that you of yourself impressions that constitute your self concept. So the theory of personality reflects the importance of coming to know yourself and being true to yourself regardless of what others may think or say. Okay. Next is, of course, the perspective of Abraham. So I will not uh, focus so much on this because I'm sure you, all, you are so familiar with Abraham. So we have here the hierarchy of needs according to Abraham Maslow. So we know it so well that uh, the basic need... Okay, at the bottom of the pyramid is your physiological needs. So we need to breathe. That's why we need air. We need to eat. That's why we need food, water, including sex, sleep, okay, or homostasis excretion. All right, next is safety and security. Um, it talks about perhaps security of the body of employment, of resources, of morality, of the family, of health, or property. And then next is, of course, your love and belongingness. And then esteem, followed, of course, by self-actualization. So according to Abraham Maslow, you cannot move to the next level if the bottom level has not been satisfied yet. Okay, that's according to Abraham Maslow. Okay, he also believed in innate or in an innate human drive towards self-actualization. This is toward becoming all that we are capable of being. So personality is perhaps best thought of as a continuing process of growth and realization, more a road to be followed than a final destination. <laughs> okay, so let's proceed now to your culture and self-identity. So collectivistic culture is actually a culture that emphasizes people's social roles and obligations. Individualistic culture, on the other hand, uh, talks about a culture that emphasizes individual identity characteristics that distinguish you from others and of course personal accomplishments okay so this ends our uh, lecture two our next topic will be on emotional aspect thank you so much for listening i'll see you on our next lecture bye